So, uh, so I got an email out of the blue a couple of years ago that uh, Rabbi Carroll was in the process of writing a book and he had come across my rabbinic thesis and he wanted to know if it would be all right to um, utilize some of the sources and, and cite the, the thesis. And I said, of course, I, that, I thought the only people who had read it were Rick Sarrison, who was my advisor, uh, my parents, uh, who told me they read it. I, I didn't quiz them on it. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and somebody else from the college who would uh, give it the, the proper okay. And uh, uh, so I was, I was thrilled that, uh, but I, you know, and then, of course, in the process of writing the book, I didn't hear for a little while. And a few months ago, I heard from uh, Rabbi Carroll that the book had been indeed published. Thank you. Take one. I'll take one. <laughs> and take one. And uh, and so as we were talking about it, uh, talking about this, and and I got a copy of the book and was very excited about the, about the whole thing. And then um, we talked about perhaps doing a program here at Temple Jeremiah, and. So here we are this evening. And just by way of brief introduction, uh, Rabbi Carroll is a native of Kansas City, Missouri, and he's the Rabbi Emeritus of Temple Isaiah in Stony Brook, New York. He was ordained, as I said, from the Hebrew Union College, Jewish Institute of Religion in Cincinnati, go Cincinnati, 1977, yeah. and has served at Temple Beth Zion in Buffalo, New York, Congregation Sharei Shalom in Ingham, Ingham Massachusetts, and Temple Isaiah, as mentioned earlier. Uh, he continues to teach for Temple Isaiah and for the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Stony Brook University. He has been a blogger for JewishSacredAging.com and for JewishFunerals.org. Uh, his book, Finding Hope and Faith in the Face of Death, Insights of a Rabbi and Mourner, was given to the newly ordained Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion uh, rabbinic students in 2019 and was on the reading list for a doctoral program at HUC in New York for the spring of the 2021 semester. Uh, and uh, he lives in Port Jefferson Station, New York now with his wife, Donna. And I'm gonna shut up. And uh, Rabbi Carroll, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And for all of those who are on Zoom, thank you for being with us. For those who are present in the room, thank you for being with us. Rabbi Carroll, <coughs> the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Good it's evening. nice, nice to, to be with you. Being with you, of course, has a different definition now, but I'm, I consider that I am with you and you're with me. Um, and I want to thank you for joining me for this presentation. And it was a real pleasure setting this up with, with Rabbi Cohen. So here is the title of my second book. Um, and there are four parts to what I'm going to do tonight. Um, first, I want to share with you four stories involving signs, personal stories. Second, teach you about uh, Jewish beliefs that I and other people characterize as supernatural, about life, death, and the afterlife. Third, share with you some of the 75 stories that were submitted to me by family and friends and colleagues and congregants and that are included in the book. And fourth, you're going to have the opportunity to ask questions, make comments, or if you'd like, share your own experiences. Okay. Oops. Too fast. Nope, too much. There we go. Okay. So when the uh, COVID-19 pandemic reached Long Island in March of 2020, and then New York Governor Andrew Cuomo announced stay-at-home regulations, I had some doubts about how I was going to spend my free time. Although I'm retired, I had a full schedule of classes to take and classes to teach, out there in the pre-pandemic world. Previously, when my wife Donna, who's a music teacher at a private school and a piano teacher with her own studio, 
and I would talk about our days during dinner, I'd usually have a lot to say about how I'd spent my mornings and afternoons. Faced with what I thought would be the prospect of going nowhere and doing nothing, I became concerned that she would get bored with me. <laughs> so um, she thought I was kidding. I was really concerned. So we were sitting at the kitchen table one night when all of a sudden music began to play on my iPad. My iTunes app hadn't been selected and the song hadn't been queued up or played recently. It was an oldie from the 60s, which some of you may remember, by the Turtles called I Know She'd Rather Be With Me. We searched and searched for a reason why this particular song would be playing so randomly and without either one of us having initiated it. We were shocked and confused, and then we smiled. We felt we had gotten a message. Some months ago, Donna and I were discussing her relationships with her mother and grandmother, both of whom had died. She was telling me a story to be included in the book that contained negative references to both women. Donna decided to take a break from our conversation and she went outside to the deck of our apartment. Glancing down at the floor, she found a peanut. I used to eat peanut butter, but not peanuts in the shell. Neither one of us eats on the deck. We live on the second floor of our building, so it couldn't have been dropped there by someone else. Our cleaning woman is the only other person who comes into our apartment mostly, and she doesn't bring peanuts with her, I asked. Its appearance was a mystery, except that when Donna found the nut, she had a flashback to her late grandmother, who whenever she left the house, would always take a piece of bread and a peanut with her. God forbid she should go hungry. <laughs> Overcome with emotion, Donna threw the nut over the railing to the grass below, but then came in and told me what happened and said, we've got to go find it. When we went downstairs outside to find the peanut in the dark, something else happened. We smelled the distinctive sweet fragrance of Donna's late mother's perfume. There was no one else around. The windows and sliding doors of the apartments on both the first floor and the second floor were all closed. The fragrance didn't seem to have a source, but it was pervasive. By the way, I found the peanut the next day and then came up to my computer and deleted any negative references to her mother and grandmother <laughs> from my manuscript. <laughs> <clears throat> Last year, I was asked to conduct a funeral for a man I didn't know. This isn't unusual for me as a retired rabbi and this service was like many others that begin at a funeral home and conclude at a cemetery. The widow and her two children delivered the eulogies and each one of them spoke about their husband and father as having been the fix-it man. They all agreed that he would fix things in the house with rubber bands, paper clips, and duct tape. Their reminiscing brought smiles to the faces of family and friends, especially when one of them remarked that this was his way of making everything okay. As I left the funeral home and headed to my car, I looked down at the small patch of grass between the door and the parking lot. And I had been doing funerals at this funeral home for about 18 years. And what I'm gonna tell you next had never happened before. There among the leaves of grass was a rubber band. I did a double take picked it up, put it on my wrist, and concluded that this was a sign from the deceased. When we all got together at the grave, I walked up to the wife before I started the service, handed her the rubber band and said, I found this outside the funeral home. I think it's a message from your husband that everything's going to be okay. She and her children teared up, nodded, and thanked me. I did a number of funerals during the beginning of the pandemic while wearing a mask and social distancing. They were all graveside ceremonies with a limited number of people. At one of them, for the first time in more than 40 years of my conducting funerals, 
The mourners brought a bottle of gin and some cups to share a toast to the deceased. They described her as a woman who loved life. And I found out that she loved to drink gin and have a certain brand of ice cream every night. Shortly after the service concluded and they were all enjoying their tribute to her with more than a sip of gin, <laughs> I heard a familiar sound coming from one of the streets that runs parallel to the cemetery. The sound was the music from a Mr. Softy truck, which was the deceased favorite brand of ice cream. The mourners and I were convinced that it was a sign from their mom and grandma. There we go. Now I know that many people will be cynical about these experiences. Skeptics will certainly ask a number of pertinent questions. How can you possibly think that a peanut could have any meaning at all? Can't the playing of a song be explained logically rather than seeing some supernatural significance in it? Wasn't it just coincidence that you hear about the man who used rubber bands and then for the first time in 18 years and the only time in 18 years, you see one in the, in the grass? And isn't it just random rather than purposeful that a Mr. Softy truck would be passing by a cemetery at a time when a woman who had loved that ice cream was being buried. <laughs> I've asked questions like this for most of my life. I always believed in logic and pure coincidence. Even though I've been a spiritual leader, I didn't share the spiritual imp interpretation that some of my congregants and friends attached to seemingly random experiences. While I've always believed that God works in mysterious ways, I was convinced that there was no reasonable explanation for random occurrences other than coincidence or just plain dumb luck. I had been trained by my parents at my temple and at rabbinical school to use intellect and logic to analyze why and how things happen in the world. I believe the supernatural should be viewed symbolically and metaphorically, a representation of an idea, but not reality itself. Okay, so we're gonna go back just a little bit here. There we go. The appearance of Elijah on Passover is a good example of that. Sorry, we'll go back to King Saul. What is important is the hope that Elijah represents rather than a too literal connection and contention that someone who didn't die could miraculously visit every house where a Seder is being held. Similarly, my fellow Jews didn't pray for resurrection of the dead as our more traditional Jewish friends did. We were taught that we achieve immortality through our deeds in life and in the memories of our loved ones and friends. When we would say that our souls would return to God in the world to come when we died, I never thought that there could be any connection between those who have died and those who are still alive. There's Elijah. Sorry, Saul really wants to get in here, <laughs> but he's getting in here a little bit early. When I began my voluntary early retirement in the summer of 2014, I embarked on a journey that had intellectual, social, and spiritual aspects. Jewish beliefs about the afterlife and mysticism interested me the most, and I've been fascinated by what I've learned. In addition to learning from professors and instructors, I've talked with my wife, Donna, my rabbinic colleagues, friends and acquaintances who've had experiences with signs from deceased relatives and friends. I've studied Jewish texts such as the Talmud, the Pirkei Avot, the sayings of the fathers, 
the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the Zohar, the mystical book of enlightenment, and the Midrash, our legend literature. And I've discovered that there's a series of books called God Winks, an area of psychology <clears throat> pertaining to coincidence, but connected to God, and a large body of literature about signs. I've also found that many people who have experiences about what they interpret as signs are reluctant to share them with others, including family members. They're afraid of being dismissed and disregarded and disrespected. So when they find an attentive ear and a receptive spirit, they feel affirmed and reassured and normal. And what struck me the most about these people and their stories is that they are happy to have these experiences and to share them with others. They aren't spooked. They aren't gloomy or at all, at all like that. For many, it has strengthened their belief in God, eternal life, boundless love, and great hope. There is much more in Jewish tradition about the links between the living and the dead than I ever thought possible. Too often, we Jews and Christians and Muslims tend to look to one text or one story to prove a point or establish a custom or belief. For example, now you're on King Saul, the book of 1 Samuel contains an incident in which King Saul goes to the witch of Endor to bring the prophet Samuel back to life. She does, and the prophet yells at Saul for doing something that the Torah absolutely forbade. Suffice it to say that things don't end well for Saul. But there's more to Jewish belief, belief through the generations than that one story. And I've tried to be as inclusive as possible in my book while maintaining a deep respect for our tradition. So what happens is that um, I go back about 4,000 years ago and confront the fear of idolatry and of the pit, uh, which was known as Sheol. The rabbis in later centuries thought about voices from above and spirits in cemeteries, and ex they explore how supernatural phenomena made their way into prayers and customs. The book also discusses whether Judaism believes in heaven and hell and calls them that, and if not, how the afterlife is perceived. It deals with the sense of cause and effect in our lives and whether we have the power to make things happen through prayer or superstition to produce the results we want, or is it all just dumb luck and pure coincidence? So for those of you that are sports fans like I am, and who believe that you have power over your teams to make things happen <laughs> by wearing certain clothing or by sitting in a certain spot on your sofa or in your easy chair when you're watching games. That's discussed in my book. We also go on what I call a, a magical mystery ride with Jewish mysticism and Hasidic stories and focus on one famous Jewish prayer spoiler alert, it's the Kaddish, that our tradition says has the power to affect the afterlife of the deceased. It gives testimony to the recipients of signs through dreams and a sense of their loved one's presence, through significant numbers repeating and coins appearing out of nowhere, and through music playing and lights flashing or not for no apparent reason. It mentions familiar shapes, and persistent animals around us, meaningful objects cropping up out of nowhere, and lights and photos that weren't visible when the picture was taken. Finally, it considers the possibility that instead of being weird, delusional, silly, and ridiculous, the people who experience signs are the recipients and the beneficiaries of blessings made possible by God. So, um, I'm going to guess that just about everybody is familiar with the term beshert, no matter how it's spelled, your soulmate when it's used as a noun or predestined when it's not used that way. So in the Talmud, 
there is a statement that says God takes single individuals and causes them to dwell in a house by properly matching a man to a woman. It goes on. This is similar to the exodus from Egypt, which culminated in the splitting of the Red Sea, where God released prisoners into prosperity. The assumption being that the rabbi who wrote this thought that single individuals were somehow prisoners and that marriage equated with prosperity. The, the next statement here is uh, about what happens before someone is born. A divine voice, which I'll talk about later, a representative of God in feminine form, does the matchmaking, is essentially the yenta for people. The Zohar, the source of mysticism in Judaism, uh, focuses on the marriage between Rebecca and Isaac and says that God was the matchmaker with a capital M. And then we have this quotation from Rabbi Maurice Lamb, who is uh, renowned as an expert on Jewish mourning customs and practices, obviously the Jewish way in death and mourning. And the most significant phrases here for me are that a belief in the afterlife is to the soul what oxygen is to the lungs, and that there is little meaning to life unless there is a world beyond the grave. Okay. The Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, is not the only source of Jewish beliefs about the afterlife, but it's the first one. It was common to refer to death as being gathered to one's kin or fathers or people. And I find that to be really interesting because when I conduct funerals and people give eulogies, they say with as much assurance as they can that they believe that their deceased loved one who has died is with the people who have predeceased them and that they are in essence gathered to one's kin, just like it says back in Genesis and even later on in the Tanakh. So in those days, there was no concept of soul yet. And once someone was buried, their destination was referred to as Sha'ol, otherwise known as the pit, the dust, and the darkness. So as you can see, hopefully, this belief goes all the way back to Abraham. Several hundred years later, the residents of Jerusalem lived amongst the Canaanites. And in the valley that is now between the old city and the new city, the Canaanites would sacrifice their children to the pagan god Baal. Sacrificing your children, in my opinion, was the Jewish idea of hell, although that term wasn't really used. Gay Hinom or Gay Henna, the gay part of it means valley. And that's where they were, that's where the sacrifices took place. <clears throat> On the right here, there is a quotation from the Mishnah. Um, and actually one that appears in our prayer book. And it talks very specifically about the things that someone should do in order to reach the world to come. And no surprise, written by a rabbi, it says the study of Torah is equal to them all. Then there's a statement from the Mishnah. Every Israelite has a portion in the world to come. So if you're Jewish, you're in. Congratulations. However, there's another opinion. There are those who are disqualified, even if they are Jewish. One who desecrates holy things, one who condemns the festivals, whatever that means, one who publicly shames one another person, one who does not observe Brit Milah, one who misinterprets the Torah, whatever that means, one who not denies resurrection, one who whispers incantations over a wound, one who reads outside books, which mean uh, books that are not in the uh, canonized collection of Jewish books, and one who utters the divine name. So in other words, if you say what yud heh vav -Hey actually says, instead of saying Adonai or Hashem or something like that, 
or even Lord, then you're not going to make it according to this particular quotation. Okay. So there are different opinions about what the, what the world to come is like and uh, what's going to happen when you get there. So I regard the statement on the left from the Talmud by Rav as pure speculation for the simple reason that he says with certainty what the world to come is like and how it differs from this world, but he hasn't been there. It's known he didn't have a near-death experience. And he says this with the certainty of a true believer. So you can see what it's like and what it's not like there, according to him. Then we, on the right-hand side, we have other quotations, which the first two coming from the Talmud. Um, what's it going to take to make it to the world to come? So whoever utters songs of praise will be privileged to do so in the world to come. So if you're ever singing a song in synagogue or at home, praise to God for what a wonderful world we have, then according to Rabbi Joshua Ben Levy, you're going to make it. Congratulations again. Rabbi Eliezer takes a little different point of view. He's more concerned with what happens with how we treat our children and that um, we, do, we don't want them to have to memorize things. Uh, we make sure <clears throat> that they have a good relationship of the with the disciples of the sages, that when you pray, you know before whom you stand. And because of that, you're going to reach the world to come. Then a rabbi uh, of uh, the, the 20th, and perhaps she lived to the 20th, 21st century, I can't remember, a Talmudic scholar, sort of disputes some of the reason as to why these uh, Spec the speculation was done and says that in a good part of our literature, the rabbis didn't want people to spend a lot of time fixating on what the world to come was like. They wanted them to pay more attention to what happened in this world. And I don't know about you, but that's what I grew up with. That's what I was told should be done. So what I was taught in my temple, a reformed temple, as an adolescent about Jewish beliefs in the supernatural is that they were illogical or unprovable, impossible or metaphorical, or just pure fantasy. But what I've con come to accept as I've gotten older is that they don't have to be logical in order to be provable, and that what may seem to be impossible is not necessarily just metaphorical or pure fantasy. In particular, the ability for us to receive communication from those who have died is what could be called supernatural, but doesn't have to be labeled as anti-God or anti-religious. So we have all of these topics here that I, that I talk about in the book. They're supernatural as far as I'm concerned, events or phenomena, beliefs or superstition, but they're not only incorporated in our prayers, but also in our culture. Some are even integral to holidays, life cycle events, and our language. So let's start with resurrection of the dead, to chiyat hamitim in Hebrew. Um, it really is an important uh, doctrine in traditional Jewish theology. And under it, Jews believe that when the Messianic age comes, the temple is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. Jew the Jewish people will be ingathered from the corners of the earth, bodies of the dead will be brought back to life and reunited with their souls. And as it says, it's not entirely clear whether only Jews or all people are expected to be resurrected at this time. So um, there's one particular funeral home that I do funerals with. In fact, I have a funeral with them on Friday and they provide a package of Israeli soil for every burial in keeping with the traditional belief that any Jew buried outside the diaspora with Israeli soil in their grave, no matter when they die, will automatically be eligible for the resurrection. Their bodies will be reconstituted. 
they will be sent via subterranean tunnels to the land of Israel, to the city of Jerusalem, to the Mount of Olives, and will witness the coming of the Messiah. Uh, they won't be uh, without clothing. They won't be in shrouds anymore. They will have clothing on, although it's not really specific. And uh, people have asked me when I say this at a funeral, is it going to be the 42-year-old me or the 82-year-old me that's going to get sent? And, I, and my response is, I don't know. But uh, if God can make this happen, then God can make anything happen. I also say to them that I don't pray for the resurrection of the dead, which you see here in the parentheses. And this is from our most recent prayer book in the reform movement. Um, so I don't really believe in the resurrection of the dead. However, I have informed my wife that if I predecease her, that and I want I want this funeral home to do my funeral because they're the only one on Long Island that provides these bags of soil, and uh, I want soil put into my grave because there is a possibility that I might be wrong. <laughs> so it's kind of like an insurance policy for me. Okay, Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanavi. Um, I'm just going to kind of go through some of the things here. He is really uh, praised by Penina Shram, who's a storyteller and author. And she collected uh, a lot of Elijah stories. So um, you may know that in the Tanakh, he doesn't die. A fiery chariot appears and he is brought up to the heavens in a whirlwind. And his successor, Elisha, whom he has trained, takes over for him. Throughout history and throughout Jewish tradition, Elijah has been, come to be recognized as a forerunner of the Messiah, as the arbiter of Jewish law. In fact, the rabbis said that uh, when Elijah comes back, he will settle legal arguments between them and um, that anything that is not decided, it sort of goes into a suspended animation legally. Uh, and Elijah will take care of it in due time. He is uh, regarded as a mediator between parents and children, praised by the prophet Malachi as such. As you know, he's a visitor at every Pesach Seder. We have a cup of Elijah at every Seder. There is a, a song sung at the Seder and during Havdalah about him, of course, Eliyahu Hanavi. There is a chair of Elijah at every bris. He is mentioned in the Birkat Hamazon, the blessing after meals, and he's asked to bring us, bring us good tiding, deliverance, and consolation. And there are literally hundreds of stories about him. The bot kol, the divine voice. So the bot part of it here, as, as you probably guessed, means daughter. It's a feminine manifestation of God. When prophecy ended in the late 400s BCE with the prophet Malachi, um, the, the Talmud tells us that the bat kol was sent as a voice from above that was regarded as an echo of prophecy. And the bat kol would come and have conversations with people, but also with inanimate objects. And you notice here, that I mentioned with a few mountains. So um, there, there's one instance of the bot coal talking with the mountains near Mount Sinai that are jealous that Mount Sinai has been chosen. And the bot coal tells them just to calm down that they'll be taken care of in the future and don't worry about it. Uh, you can see there are also other uh, people with whom the bot coal has conversations uh, does predictions about the future, and uh, the bot coal is very much accepted as being legitimate, although supernaturally so, in the Talmud. Rachel. So, um, Rachel was the fourth of the matriarchs. You see her relationship here as a daughter, a sister, and a wife. She was beautiful, but she couldn't have children, supposedly. She was the mother of Joseph, 
and she died in childbirth when Benjamin was born. She was buried by Jacob along the road to Bethlehem, according to Genesis. And eventually there was a tomb that was set, set up there that became a shrine where people would come and pray to her. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah has this really well-known quotation, which refers to Rachel and I think gave her an incredible amount of influence and power, so to speak, um, where he, he's, he has God talking to Rachel and telling her to stop crying that her children that, that have walked past her on the way to the Babylonian exile will return. And 70 years later, that's exactly what happened to them. Uh, one other thing I want to say about Rachel. Um, so I, I have uh, Orthodox cousins who live in Israel and specifically in Jerusalem. And one of my co cousins who's very from um, talks about Mama Rachel all the time. And, and she, Mama Rachel at home, before the pandemic, she would make a pilgrimage every Friday to the tomb to offer prayers. And I said to her, uh, what, do you, what do you pray for? And she said, I pray for everything and anything and everybody and anybody, because I know Mama Rachel's going to answer my prayers. Um, and she's in good company. When they couldn't go there, uh, they were able to do it on Zoom. So Zoom comes into play in a lot of different ways. We also have prayers and songs that, uh, that deal with what I call the supernatural. We have evil angels in the evil eye. So um, there's a prayer that can be said when one wakes up, Moda or Moda Ani, in which we thank God for waking up and returning our soul to us that has been in God's care while we're sleeping. We sing Adon Olam, which is akin to Moda Ani, because it says, into your hand I entrust my spirit when I sleep and when I wake. We sing about angels. Shalom Aleichem. For Lacha Dodi, we imagine the Shabbat as a bride. And I don't know what it's like in your congregation, but in ours, for the last verse, we turn around and face the door as if the bride is coming in, penetrating the walls, coming into our sanctuary. Angels uh, in the Torah are mentioned. Uh, most of them good. Some of them have names. Most of them don't. Hagar and Ishmael, Abraham and Isaac, Jacob, Moses and the burning bush, Balaam's donkey, which is smarter than he is, and the three men in the furnace in the book of Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are their Babylonian names. Satan, or Satan in Hebrew, is referred to as the troublemaker, the adversary, and comes into a play in a lot of ways, in particular in the book of Job, at the beginning of the book of Job. The angel of death, you should know, um, partly from Pesach, but also... Uh, custom of covering mirrors and lighting a memorial candle in a house of mourning. Uh, there was a belief that uh, the angel of death, if the angel of death saw your image in a mirror, the angel of death would point his, point his bony finger at you and say you're next. Uh, and lighting a memorial candle, supposedly, uh, the angel of death doesn't like light. Finally, the evil eye pronounced by some people as Kenahara, which is said to prevent evil. Uh, you know, it's sort of like uh, you don't want to jinx something, so you say Kenahara. Like, uh, what a beautiful child, Kenahara. Yeah. So, someone might think the child's name is Kenahara, yes. by the way. <laughs> Somebody might think the child's name is Kenahara. Okay. Um, wanted you to uh, to see some of the excerpts from uh, your rabbi's thesis here. Uh, w very well done. I, I just want to say that he was very gracious and menschlich to allow me to quote from his senior thesis. And uh, so the impression that, that I get from what he has written, and I hope I'm 
quoting from you, Rabbi Cohen, and, and getting the right impression, uh, a number of things which sort of fit in with what, with what my book is about. Um, signs are communications uh, from God. They, are, they can be regarded as natural phenomena for human beings to experience. Uh, you don't have to be special to see a sign, uh, which is something that not everybody understands, nor do you have to actively seek it out. Uh, they can be viewed as the work of God, and the rabbis learn to read them and attach, attach significance to them so that they can understand the world better. So I say in the book that uh, I'm well aware that the signs that some people believe they're receiving from deceased loved ones would not be regarded by some people on the same level or in the same class as those that are mentioned in, in the thesis. But they have a common thread. And that's the belief that God is behind them. Just as the rabbis could decide what the reason was for something that was happening, so could we. In fact, the next to the last statement here is, signs are seen as the work of God existing in the world around us, and even at times emanating from within us. I really believe in that. And just as they could think that God was behind what happened to them, and especially the phenomena and events that couldn't be explained logically, then so can we. Okay, so I, um, how are we doing for time here? Um, we're running a little bit short on time if we want to open it up to questions and, and conversation as well. Okay. Um, okay, so then I will do that and what I, what I was going to show you was some of the, some of the stories of the 75, but um, you can see that in the book. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, comments, questions, anything that anybody wants to share? I wanna ask about um, cremation. Uh, I was always under the impression that cremation was not a Jewish way. Um, however, in, in today's world, uh, with all the, the land, uh, I always thought the cre cremation would be a better way to go. But how would that affect, if all of this is in actuality, how would that affect my afterlife? So you're right, according to tradition, uh, someone's body should not be cremated. The, the body is uh, given to us by God and, and to not have it um, in the ground and return to the ground from whence it came, as the tradition would say, then uh, that's an issue. Um, my, my, I mean, I do a lot of memorial services where cremation has taken place. So I don't have a problem with it, although I don't want to have myself be cremated. Anyway, um, so the, the, the whole thing about signs is, is spiritual. It involves people's spirits. So their spirits are separate from whether they're buried or whether they're cremated. And so communication between the spirit of a deceased person and someone who's alive, there wouldn't be a problem with cremation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I found... Um, Rabbi was it and and is the idea that if God is the creator of the world, that 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 for the rabbis and and for many of us, that you can just as you read a book that was written by an author, and you can mm -hmm. get insight into that author and and learn things that perhaps the author wasn't even necessarily aware of when writing that particular piece that the that many of the the signs many of the things that that are perceived are are built in right so that that the rabbis in talking about miracles not really being miracles there were certain things that were built in Balaam's donkey uh the, the talking donkey was something that was established at creation of the world and that uh the connection that god wants to continue to communicate through this unfolding of creation, this continuation of, of the work 
of the of the author of creation, um, and that we can we can see these things if we are open to that. That they're 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 there, and and perhaps the the best example is in in Torah at least is Moses at the burning bush, and that. Uh, there, there's many commentators that talk about how that bush had been aflame for a very long time. And Moses was the only one who took the time to notice and to see that oh, there might be something really interesting here or something unusual here. And that's how Moses' relationship with God begins and continues. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great insight. Um, I. The, the, thing, the thing about signs is that uh, one has to be receptive to them, just as one can be receptive of or accepting of the idea that something that occurs or something that they see or something that they experience has a divine connection to it. And so I, I see a, a big similarity there. And, and in all the literature about signs, um, People who write about them say, "You you can't you can't force it. You can't uh, say you've seen something just because you want to make somebody else happy, or that you've had an experience. You have to really be on the lookout for it, and and be willing to be receptive and accepting of it. And and I think that's really crucial. I think for a long time I just." I just was thinking too logically about how things occurred and um, and I had the way opened up for me and uh, it's really it really makes a difference. It's an additional way in which to view the world and I think a beautiful way in which to view the world. An experience not too long ago uh, at a funeral um, when I was doing the um, the meeting with the family to talk about this woman who had passed away, uh, one of the grandchildren, the adult grandchildren, had asked if I believe that there was the possibility that this, this their grandmother could communicate. And uh, I was very open, and I, I, I said, I, I know that there are people who have made that connection. And although I haven't necessarily experienced it myself with people that have passed away in my life, um, that I, I do believe that's possible. And when we were at, um, at the cemetery, uh, just as we were bringing the casket from the, the car to the gravesite, this very large female deer walked mm-hmm. across just in front of the car. Mm-hmm. And uh, I looked to this young woman, to Jamie, and uh, said, there you go. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was very powerful uh, for her in that moment and for, for me as well, that there are these opportunities. Um, it's very rare to see a deer in a cemetery, uh, at least in this area, uh, very rare indeed. And uh, uh, just uh, that for, for her and, and for me in that moment, that uh, was, was very powerful. One of the stories I was going to share with you is... Uh from a friend who, uh, whose husband unfortunately died in a plane crash, uh, flying his private plane and, and died in it. And, uh, and he had a favorite bird. So uh, they went, uh, she went with her mother and her brother to the cemetery. Uh, he died during the summer. They went uh, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur because it was their custom to go then anyway to the cemetery. And um, as, they're, as they're moving towards his grave, there's a red-tailed hawk that is perched on a tree right near his grave. And it's sitting there and staring at them. And they, they look up and they see it. They say Kaddish, they turn around, the bird is still there. Um, that was his favorite bird. And she's convinced that it wasn't a coincidence that that happened. So uh, animals are part of it. Um, photos are part of it. In the book, I have a couple of photos. Uh, 
where there are lights that are shining that weren't shining when the picture was taken. There's a photo of a man and a woman on the beach of uh, Normandy that they visited where uh, the man's father had gone ashore during World War II. And uh, they stood there and, and said Kaddish for him and took a picture of their shadows on the sand. And when they looked at the picture later on, there was another shadow behind them. Wow. And it, it, was, it wasn't trick photography. Nobody doctored it or anything. And they're convinced that that was him. So there are, there are all kinds. Like I said, there are 75 stories in this book that I, and when I, when I got the stories from people, um, I have a big smile. I still do. Other questions, uh, mm -hmm. comments, stories that people would like to share, both uh, in the, uh, the Zoom room and uh, and present uh, with us as well. Well, I, I have a story about mm -hmm. after my sister passed away, you know, I packed up her stuff and there was some stuff was sitting in the basement. And she had these collector plates, and one of the plates, uh, her favorite entertainer was um, Frank Sinatra. And so I'm in the basement, and um, there's these plates, and they're in a box. And all of a sudden, I'm hearing the, um, the plate play. Now, mind you, this stuff has been packed away in her own house, in the box, boxes. Um, and the music, it, it, I'm hearing the music. I'm thinking, what the heck? And sure enough, it was this plate that went on. I don't know. It was it creeped me out when it was like, <laughs> "Are you here?" Well, you know, you're trying to tell me something. Is that Frank Sinatra plate? It was a yeah. Frank Sinatra plate, but it was a that musical was one. Musical. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, that was like whoa. Mm. So, I have a I have a similar story. <laughs> um, after my mother died, and she was cremated. To your point. Um, I, you know, I was talking to somebody and they said, you know, their mother had visited and I was like, oh, I wish my mother would visit. And so before I went to bed, I, I just said, mom, I'd love it if you would come see me tonight. So um, I fell asleep and I had a dream about my mom showing me um, some tchotchkes of my grandmother's that, that had real meaning to my grandmother. And she said, you know, you have to treasure these things. They, they have real value. That was my dream. Okay. I woke up in the morning. Thank you, mom. I picked up my phone and my daughter and my son, who were both home, they were downstairs, had been texting me, fury, like in all caps, you know, that the night before, where are you? We need to talk to you. There's something who, and then Maddie, my daughter, sent me a, a picture of a, um, a music box. And she said, who gave this to it? Who, who gave this to me? Who gave this to you? Who, where, where did it come from? It was from my mom. So I went downstairs and the two kids were totally shaken. They said during the night, okay, they, they had been, my daughter had been in her bedroom and my son had been in another room. And in a third room was this music box that my mom had given to my daughter. And it had an angel and it had a song about the afterlife. And um, I had not thought much of it. I'd been cleaning up, it was just, something. I didn't even remember that my mom had given it to my daughter and I put it on the floor and I wasn't going to give it away necessarily. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with it. I hadn't taken proper care of it. My daughter was in her room. She heard music play and she freaked out. So she called, she texted her brother, come here and tell me if you hear music playing. They both heard the music playing. He tracked it down, found it. The and it was playing music and it, and he said it was turning, like somebody had <gasps> turned it. So um, yeah, I, <laughs> the, the dream about taking proper care of things that have sentimental value mm -hmm. that really mean something. And both my son and daughter having this encounter with, um, I'd had other experiences, but this one, we all, <laughs> We're in agreement. Yes, mom visited. Yeah. And it was beautiful. And you're right. It wasn't frightening at all. It was beautiful. Yeah. One, one of the uh, stories in, in the book uh, is about finding coins. Uh, 
actually several stories about finding coins. And uh, in one of them, um, this woman writes about after her mother died, she, she was finding quarters um, in, in weird places in the house. And uh, she thought it was strange, but she would pick them up. And she said that, that when her mom was alive, she told her daughter and, um, and her son that, you know, they should uh, pay attention to the quarters because someday there'll be college money. And that's a lot of quarters. And uh, so uh, she, the, this, this woman was a little reluctant to tell her brother that this was going on, but she finally called him up and she said to him, I don't want you to think I'm weird, but I keep finding quarters. And I, 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 I have a sense that it's like mom is here. And she, he didn't respond to her right away. And she said, are you okay? What's, what's going on? He said, I'm trying to raise my jaw back up because my jaw just dropped because I've been finding quarters too. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and even more than that, they checked when they were finding quarters and they were on the same day. Oh, one in New York and one in Pennsylvania. Oh, just pure coincidence, right? <laughs> can't convince me of that anymore but it is interesting that there isn't consistent because you would think that if it can happen in this way what why doesn't it happen more often or if it does why don't we see it more often right Alina, I triggered I, something. It just made me think about the burning bush and yeah. how do we know it isn't yeah. happening and we just right. don't see it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. But then maybe it has to be a little more out of the ordinary. It has to really something that catches our attention differently than maybe before be because concentrating more on what we're you know, there might have been other music playing at different times and something just and you didn't hear it or you know, you had something else on that was too loud and you couldn't hear it or something else happening. But it is it is kind of remarkable that it isn't something necessarily that's spoken about every day. Right, Jeannie? Right. From the ridiculous, um, this is a true story. <clears throat> my sister-in-law, my husband's wife, was a very troubled woman and, and she had got through concentration camp and all that. So ultimately she committed suicide. <clears throat> and after her death, her husband told us that he would find thousand dollar bills under the mattress, inside huh. pillowcases, think places that shouldn't have. I said, thousand dollar bills is better than quarters, you know? <laughs> 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 That's a sign. <laughs> Steve? I have a question for you. I can tell you one of my own, but I'm curious as to whether any of your stories involve people who were um, visited and there was a sensation of being touched. Mm -hmm. Yes. Touched. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the stories is about uh, someone who um, who uh, is is at, at, a, at her home home with her mother and her aunt and she does she's not the one that's touched but her mother says afterwards that she and this is a little complicated she and her sister the aunt and mother of the person i'm mentioning saw their mother there and their mother was putting her hands on their shoulders and they felt it mm -hmm. So yeah, sometimes they are, there are sometimes like that. The, the whole idea of sense of, I mean, it, it's sort of a general thing to call it sense of presence and how is it manifested? It's manifested through a feel, through a touch. Sometimes it can be, uh, you know, when you feel a chill, but you're not cold. Uh, when music plays, when you find an object that has been lost forever and all of a sudden it appears. Uh, when music plays, like the like, uh, like was just mentioned before, it's just, there are just so many different ways. And the the weird thing too is is the is the animals. Uh, cardinals are very prominent in signs literature. If you see a red cardinal, it's pretty rare. 
and and that's taken as as um, a sign of a deceased loved one. We had that, we had that occurrence. Um, there was a young man who died by suicide um, towards the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, he was just eighteen years old. And um, his mother asked me about cardinals because all of a sudden there was a cardinal outside the kitchen window that had not been there before. So, yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting that you should say that because when people tell me about cardinals, they are usually outside a kitchen window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I have a story, Rabbi. Go ahead, Shirley. Okay. Um, after my husband died, I, I couldn't use his closet because it was a new closet that he loved. And everybody's telling me, you have to use the closet. So I started to put my things in his closet. And right near, I have a little rabbi doll that sings Hava Nagila. <laughs> well, this never <laughs> happened before, and it never happened since. But as I put my clothes in, the rabbi got off and sang Hava Nagila. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I just know my husband was saying, I'm so glad you're using my class. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, Hava Nagila is sung at happy yeah. occasions. So yeah. that's pretty good to me. Yeah. Interesting. This is what happens whenever I talk about the book. People just open up and share these experiences. One of you mentioned before that you didn't feel it was creepy or spooky or scary. And and I mentioned that when I when I was talking before. People just they feel warmth. They feel um they feel privileged to have what they what they believe is a connection. I have one. Yeah, I mean. um, uh, My cousin passed away uh, from a brain tumor. He was about 30. And um, the mother went to um, the grave for the first time, and there was a stray cat at the grave. And uh, as she's leaving the grave, the cat followed her. And she opened the car, and the cat jumped in the car. Oh, wow. (laughs) Um, Wow. Yeah. um, And... That cat has been with her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's quite a story. Interesting. Huh. Okay. I wanted to tell you my story um, because the way it played out sort of affirms a lot of things about being receptive to all this. Um, when my grandfather died in like. 1987, it must have been 88, 89. A few days later, I was in a hotel room in Dallas and I was asleep on my left side and someone shook me, shook my shoulder like that. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in a hotel room and someone's shaking my shoulder. And I looked over and my grandfather was, he wasn't there, but he was there and he was young and he was happy and he was laughing. He was like, hey, I got you, I got you, I got you. I woke you up and then he was gone. And it was, I had been visited by my grandmother too. So I wasn't shocked by it. And and like other people have said, it was, it was a wonderful experience. It was sort of like, oh, that's so nice. And I went back to sleep. My mom was always big into psychic occurrences and she wanted to be visited by everybody. So a few days (laughs) after my trip to Dallas, I'm on the phone with my mom and she says, "Uh, I'm, I'm very upset that your grandfather hasn't come to visit me. And I said, I, I don't, I didn't say anything. I said, I don't know what to tell you about. She says, so I went to a medium. I said, Mom, I don't want to hear about me. <laughs> I don't believe in any of this stuff you talk. She, cause she talked about this all the time. I said, I don't want to hear about it. She goes, well, I'm going to tell you what the medium said. I said, I don't want to hear about it. She says, the medium says that your grandfather was in the room. And I asked the medium, ask, my dad why he hasn't come to visit me and the medium said that he tried to visit everyone in the family but the only one who would let him in was Stephen 
It was me. <laughs> and I said, okay, mom, I guess I have something to tell you. <laughs> um, so that experience was as real as it could get. And then I wasn't going to tell anybody. And then when my mom came up with this, I was like, oh, maybe there's something to this. So what did, what did she say? Well, well, she was mad. <laughs> That's what I was going to guess. She was mad. She wanted to, she right. wanted to be visited by him. And, and, Why you, not me? Right, and and I've also been visited by somebody who was cremated. So yeah. Mm. Wow. That's so okay. Mm. Very interesting. All right. Oh, by the way, you mentioned mediums. <laughs> yeah. It's about mediums. Is about a particular medium, a uh, congregant of mine and a friend. Um, and uh, anyway, the sort of background information about mediums is presented in chapter three. And then I, I let her sort of take over and she tells her story, which people have found to be fascinating. So I'm either telling you or warning you about chapter three. <laughs> Very good. No, I can't wait. Very good. Um, <laughs> Tonight before you go to sleep. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't want to cut anybody off. Yeah. Uh, Julie. Um, my son committed suicide um, on Thanksgiving Day, and his wife, um, about two weeks later. Uh, was in bed sleeping and all of a sudden sh something shaken her, you know, just the same way my son used to wake her up and say, you know, you, you handle it, but he, you know, so, and she heard her husband calling her and saying, Dana, Dana. And, and she jumped out of bed, like something's wrong. What, 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 what I hear you. And she opened the window, you know, the curtains to the outside, and they live in the woods. And the whole yard was on fire. Oh my All God. the trees were burning. Oh and so she, she went and she got her son, and they, they called the police. And she said, we were sound asleep. We wouldn't, yeah. we wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, so she called me right away. You know, your son is still here. He's still taking care of us. Uh -huh. I want you to know this, you know. And um, he, he had given me the book Signs um, a, a while back. And um, that book is filled with different ways that um, spirit comes to visit and how you know oftentimes i mean if i saw a peanut on the floor i wouldn't it wouldn't mean anything to me but right. there were certain things that my son will send me and i will respond and know it's him and and my first reaction is relief and connection and it, it is never spooky, scary. It is never awful. Um, and it, it's just a gift, you know? And, and, you know, I believe, you know, and, and in the book Signs, they talk about um, if, if you're, if, when, when you're in spirit mode, you still have your personality. You're still you. So right. if you're a jokester, you're always going to be a jokester. And and that's kind of my son who his signs to me are pretty funny, you know. Um, but so it's it's very interesting. And and you know when I look at a lot of the things that um, various religions teach, why would we think that communication from the other side is any more bizarre than some of the teachings that come through uh, 
various pulpits and, and places, you know, I mean, really, uh, you know, it, it's like, you know, uh, all sorts of things that, that, you know, defy logic, you know, a spirit, you know, spirit reaching out to spirit, it, it is, is not logical. It's not something in the brain that, that tells us this, but it, but it is truly spirit being aware of other spirit. And um, it, it really is a, a blessing and a gift. So that's that. Mm. And wow. he was, was a gift. Yeah. Yeah. So Nancy, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, um, I did have an experience that kind of takes in some of the elements that other people have described. Mine was a dream. And in my dream, um, I lost my son. I mean, I lost him somehow. And I felt that horrible panic that a parent would feel if you lost your child in a crowd or something like that. And I was looking for him desperately everywhere. Mm -hmm. And somehow in this dream, my father came and he had maybe been dead for four or five years. In my dream, my father found my son, Ben. Okay, he found Ben. And I fell into my father's arms and I hugged him and he hugged me back. And when I woke up, I felt palpably, I could feel the contour of his body, the way it felt when he used to hug me. Mm -hmm. um, and it brought me great comfort. It really did. And then, and then something a few years later happened that, you know, some of you may remember the porch collapse accident in the city. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my son was in that accident with his girlfriend. Oh. And, you know, several of his friends died in this accident. He, because he happened to move off the porch about 10 seconds before it fell, he was in the stairwell. So mm. he fell to the ground, but he didn't fall with other floors on top of him. He survived. It. He was injured, but he lived. And I've always since then had this sense that my father was watching him. He was watching over him, that he's here, that in some way he watches over us and he protects us. And it brings me comfort, I, you know, and it's not like I was looking for some kind of, you know, mystical, spiritual thing to happen to me. It just happened. Um, and it was comforting. Mm. Amazing. Well, you've done a good job of sharing. I really appreciate hearing all these stories. They just, I, I don't know if you can see or not, but I got a big smile on my face. So do we. We <laughs> can see, we can see. Um, well, I, I uh, again, I don't want to preempt anyone. And I want to uh, thank you, uh, Stephen, for, uh, for reaching out to me initially a few years ago. Um, I, I didn't ask you how you found the thesis. Um, what, what directed you to, to the thesis? Uh, what, what directed me to the thesis was, so my daughter for the last several years has been working at HUC in New York City. Uh -huh. And 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 when I started to write this book, I said to her, um, I'm curious to find out whether anybody in the history of HUC has written a thesis on this general subject. So she said, well, I can figure it out. So she put me in touch with somebody in the library and uh, and I got information from somebody at at the Clow Library in Cincinnati, that your thesis was the prominent answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> meant to be. You're meant to be a Vishera. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for, for sharing this evening with us. Thank you for the, the book and the stories. And uh, I look forward to hearing more stories uh, uh, and, that uh, come forward as you're, as you're reading the book and uh, as we continue this journey together. Uh,
Stephen, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank you for making it possible. Thanks to all of you for uh, being here. As I said before, wherever here is or there is, it's, it's nice <laughs> to see all of you. And to, and to have you share, I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.